Welcome. Um, I'm very pleased to be uh, chairing the event tonight with um, Dietrich Dietrichson and John Roberts. Um, I am going to do slightly longer, just not, not, not a huge introduction, quite a short one, but I'd like to give a um, slightly longer introduction to both of our speakers tonight because I think, that's, I think that the work that they've been working on recently, which is obviously partially why they've been invited to speak tonight, is very relevant um, to to Hannah's work. So um, Dietrich Dietrichson is a cultural critic, as um, Anna mentioned already, and currently professor for theory, practice and communication of contemporary art at the Academy of Fine Art Vienna. He was an editor of two music magazines in the 1980s, Sounds based in Hamburg and Specs based in Cologne, and taught at several academies in the 1990s in Austria, Germany and the USA in the field of art history, musicology, theatre studies and cultural studies. Recent publications include On Surplus, Value in Art, Sternberg, uh, 2008, and most recently a monograph on the Sopranos, Diaphanous, was that the correct pronunciation of it? 2012, so that one's just out. John Roberts is Professor of Art and Aesthetics at the University of Wolverhampton and is the author of a number of books, including The Intangibilities of Form, Skill and De-Skilling in Art After the Renimade, Verso, 2007, the Necessity of Errors, also Verso, that was published last year, and Photography and Its Violations, which is forthcoming from Columbia University Press. And he's currently working on a new book for Verso on the new avant-garde. The conversation tonight will, uh, will take place, but there'll be plenty of time for um, some questions afterwards. Um, and I'll just say now, in case I forget to say later, uh, the event is being recorded. So we'd appreciate whenever um, you have some questions to ask, if you can bear to wait uh, for the microphone to come and find you. Um, we'll touch on Hannah's work, um, in, but in a more um, obtuse rather than direct manner, but there will be some direct references towards it. So tonight, utilising Hannah's exhibition, which I hope you've all had an opportunity to see, to think through accumulation and accretion, remainder and remnant, how objects and objects as commodities listened to, are touched by, and stored time spent by humans, the speed of the senses matching the labour of empathy, and sweat behind, surface wreckage up front. By way of introduction, I'm going to read three short quotes. The first is, pass is um, by Perry Anderson from Passages from Antiqu Antiquity to Feudalism. In Roman theory, the agricultural slave was designated as instrumentum vocale, the speaking to, one grade away from the livestock that constituted instrumentum semivocale, and two grades away from the ooh, instrumentum mutum. The second is from a fiction book by Nicholson Baker called The Mezzanine. Right when I suddenly had more blue sky in front of me than green truck, I remembered that when I was little, I used to be very interested in the fact that anything, no matter how rough, <coughs> rusted, dirty or otherwise discredited it was, looked good if you sat down a stretch of white cloth or any kind of clean background. The thought came to me with just that prefix when I was little, along with the sight of a certain rusted railroad spike I'd found and placed on an expanse of garage concrete that I'd carefully swept smooth. And finally, Jane Bennett, from the force of things, steps towards an ecology of matter. Tread lightly upon the earth, both because things are alive and have value, and as, uh, as, is that just gone funny? No. And as such, because we should be cautious around things that have power to do us harm. Um, I'd like uh, to invite um, both of our speakers tonight to um, address um, surplus desire. And then I'll invite a conversation, and then as I mentioned earlier, I'll invite questions from yourself. Perhaps, Dietrich, you could start. Um, maybe uh, I start with the Jane Bennett quote, um, which I, I didn't know that you would bring it up. Uh, so um, I was recently uh, thinking about um, the new the new interest in things and in, in objects. There's a general craze for objects and 
from all different from all different perspectives. I mean, it seems to be one craze, but uh, but obviously uh, all these different object-oriented ontologies, object-oriented philosophies that that came recently, or also like um, the uh, a new interest in um, in the art object, and not so much in the art object in a philosophical sense as in as in Michael Fried, uh, but the art object as in um, uh, you know, we should make objects again. It should be entities again, uh, and they are somehow uh, magical again, or they are uh, because we know now that objects are different. All this uh, led me to think about: um, Is there a way to um, to console or, or not to console to to bring together uh, the two major questions of how where objects come from, how they are made? Uh, and all these, this new philosophical and, <laughs> and magical uh, 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 return to the objects, and uh, and I thought that that like um, if if one looks at the the ways how human labor, especially in the arts, is stored by objects, how it is how it is kept by objects, how how it can even be. Uh, read out of objects. Huh? You can you can uh, you can take a recording of something, and you can uh, get at least uh, uh, a representation of the labor that went into the recording. Uh, even more so if it's a live recording and not a studio recording. And uh, how these how these different uh, ways of uh, storing human labor by objects have changed recently. Uh, um, how they how Things like recording human labor by by human memories, by uh, by body memories, by 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 skills, by by bodily remember techniques, was uh, which is financed by institutions like ballet, theater, uh, music, uh, has big problems uh, with uh, maintaining the institutions that that carry this. Uh, then uh, recording the and recording and and afterwards technically reproducing the recording as a business model is also uh, disappearing, and uh, and so are some of the some of the ways of of uh, recording human labor in in art objects, um, and all the effort goes into uh, the magic of the white cube and uh, and its successors. There are other magical magical structures, magical symbolic structures that that have the same function. And, but I think even that is also uh, um, uh, disappearing, or, or not not complete, not disappearing. But but um, there's a, there's another form that uh, that is right now um, gaining uh, momentum, and that is the contract, and uh, how how finding the contract becomes uh, the device that records uh, objects, but can is, is of course. Uh, um, um, yeah, destroys all those um, those other formats in which we have uh, have produced objects before, and how that is related maybe to the to the renaissance uh, of um, magic projections, uh, philosophical paradigm shifts uh, that uh, make us return make us return to objects. So. Um, yeah, that was that was what I thought when I heard you uh, refer to Jane Bennett, and it's obviously something that can be uh, seen also in the uh, in some of the perspectives in in, in Hannah Sauter's work. Um, maybe I mm, thank here. you, John. Yeah, um, well, I, I saw Hannah's show at uh, Bloomberg Space, and mm. I've seen the show here, obviously, and. Um, Anyways, I was in, I was intrigued um, by the work insofar as it, it it looks in two directions at once. On the one hand, um, much of the work has direct echoes of late eighties and early nineties um, uh, classic appropriationist art. I mean, the art that was very much in from New York and here in Germany and elsewhere that was identified with uh, Paul Virilio and Jean Baudrillard. Um, uh, work based upon uh, a notion of the um, re 
the photographic ready-made as a, an, an inert c commodity. But on the other hand, um, and given the techniques that she uses, the work clearly um, looks to the reduction and reception of the image um, under the conditions of our, con of our contemporary cognitive capitalism, where images um, mutate and re-mutate and, and so forth. Um, now, um, I want to talk, in, in response to that, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the life of the image under, uh, under cognitive capitalism in response to these, uh, to these prevailing conditions. Um, because what interests me, in a sense, is that uh, in contradistinction to a lot of that earlier work, um, Hannah sets up uh, an interesting sense of pathos for the contemporary uh, artists working with these, with these image regimes, insofar as the notions of change that she engages with through these forms of image mu mutation are essentially, um, uh, uh, essentially em em embedded in what we might call a sense of changeless change change without change. So the image gets mutated, but in, uh, but in, in no sense is there a, a transformative, in, in, in no sense is there a, um, a transformative process going on, in a kind of classically Galian sense from, from you know, quantity to, uh, to quality. And in, in, that, in that way, um, um, her work uh, operates within what uh, Wilhelm Flusser once called in the in the early 1980s, um, the realm of the non-symbolic. Mm -hmm. And what, what does Flusser mean by the non-symbolic, or what do I mean by that? That is, the tendency under uh, image-based capitalism to exclude the possibility of some kind of, of discursive um, stability for images. Of course, some kinds of, uh, of images you know, achieve uh, some kind of uh, discursive uh, stability, the images that we see in the mass media and so on, but um, many images don't, uh, be they uh, images produced under the auspices of, 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 of you know, advanced art or documentary images and so forth. Now, these kinds of images, um, in some sense, have no symbolic life because they don't, they, they don't get re re reproduced under... under uh, the image regimes of, of capitalism. And given that, um, image production within the realm of the symbolic op op operates a bit like a pinball machine. There's a lot of activity going on. Images zing about. Yeah, they arrive at destinations, various kinds of destinations, uh, all the time. They do interesting things. They make you know, lots of uh, noise, and they throw on lights and so forth. But, but nothing, nothing, st nothing stabilizes. And... Um, um, this seems to be um, uh, one of the prevailing conditions or symptoms for, um, for artists engaging with these regimes of Im image production today. So there's a lot of activity, but it's uh, um, activity that produces um, little sense of discursive stability or affect. Now, as you may know, um, there's been a huge uh, amount uh, written over the last uh, 100 years, really, um, within the Western philosophical tradition and within uh, uh, the traditions of critical theory on the waning of affect. And it's almost a commonplace when it comes to um, talking about uh, contemporary capitalism and cognitive capitalism and, and so forth. But nonetheless, nevertheless, I think I think we need to um, uh, address this question of of the waning of, of effect because seems this seems to be the uh, the the ground zero condition of a lot of work with 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 images. Um, so we're I think we're faced with a certain kind of um, crisis today around uh, the reception of the of the image. And this has a lot to do, on the one hand, then, with, as I've said, the waning of effect 
and the reproduction of the non uh, of the non symbolic. But it also has a lot to do with what I would call, as a consequence of this, the crisis of of, of Bildung. That is communities of critical self learning as a condition of the reception of the image. Now, no significant art practices uh, in the 20th century have, um, <coughs> have developed and flourished without establishing a critical public for themselves, a sense of Bildung. Um, I mean, certainly uh, in, uh, from the 1920s to the, mid to, the middle of the, to the middle of the 20th century, um, modernist painting was able to do that. It was able to establish a critical public for itself that had some kind of, of partisan relationship to art's place in the world, that is, some kind of transformative relationship um, to, to, to art in the world. Likewise with uh, social documentary practice from around the 1920s up, up into to the 1960s. Um, Bill Dong was crucial to the, to the, the social place, uh, affectivity and affects of, of, of both modernist <coughs> painting and social documentary practice. Certainly since the 1960s, with the rise of the uh, market socialization of art, which, uh, of course, dovetails with uh, the rise of these um, uh, new conditions of image, image production, um, the possibility of that occurring has been grossly diminished. So, um, anyways, what we, I mean, <laughs> what we find today um, is... Um, it's precisely an attempt on, on the part of artists to produce art in concord with the creation of some sense of build on. That's precisely what the rise of uh, relational aesthetics, post relational aesthetics, and participatory um, art, art practices is, is, is all about. Um, uh, a massive kind of um, A range of uh, socially compensatory um, f forms of, of community interaction and independence between art, art and the social. So, um, looking at looking at Hannah's looking at Hannah's work, um, which which is working very much within uh, this uh, image form tradition that I've I've just mapped out. There's a kind of um, there's a kind of rejection, well maybe this is open for you know, contestation and, 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 and discussion. There's a kind of, of rejection of the possibility of, of building. Uh, before I move, uh, before I, I invite Dietrich to respond, I just want to clarify something. What do you mean by advanced art? I mean art that establishes a relationship with parts to art on the basis that the art of the past does not um, fulfill, or doesn't ask the right questions of, um, of, of, of the contemporary. So it's about asking questions. It's not that um, the, uh, the art of the moment, the advanced art of the moment is better than the advanced art of the past or transcends the art of the past. Really, that, that it's asking a new set of questions in response to, to, to the given conjuncture, conjuncture um, Mm. which is being produced in Okay, yeah. thank you. Dietrich. Yeah, uh, I'd like to... Uh, first, I'd like to um, uh, say a little bit something about um, how you were reconstructing the 80s. Um, um, I'm actually... Um, I would like to... I mean, I would like to establish some kind of relation that we have today, or could have, uh, to this to this moment of uh, simultaneously uh, with the simultaneous appearance of, let's say, Baudrillard, Virilio, Peter Halle, David Byrne, um, post post um, uh, pictures generation, um, um, shiny New York. Um, art production that is uh, trying to be as close to uh, a semblance of, of, of commodity forms. Uh, at the same time, uh, hyper-pessimist, uh, um, um, existentialist, uh, um, um, yeah, 
versions of former Marxist ideas, like uh, uh, there is no outside of uh, the law of value or something like that, that becomes in Baudrillard something uh, there is no outside of the simulacrum. Uh, then, then also a period of uh, of a lot of like post histoire ideas. The history is over. Uh, history was over before uh, uh, before the, the the major historical uh, uh, event came. Uh, that's something that's very forgotten often. That, that that the history was really already in many minds over in the eighties. Uh, then it started again, and then could again be over. And uh, of course, this is a. a <laughs> very problematic position and a very specific, um, I don't know, ideological uh, perspective, this, this, uh, this post-historic post um, uh, yeah, idea, the idea of, of a post-histoire. So, but if you, if you look at what was going on historically in, 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 this, in this period, um, it was of course, um, uh, it, there were many cycles of repetition in there, uh, there were things repeated uh, that, that had not been thought through uh, in, 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 in the repetition or, or there was, it was not, didn't have the form of a retrospective or a revival or something like that. It was more like kind of a manic repetition and, uh, and this manic repetition could be easily slipped between two types of effects, between, between uh, hysterical uh, laughter and, and deep depression. And, and I think that is, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, a general feeling that is not so different from, from, uh, from many contemporary feelings, although uh, uh, there are huge historical differences. And, and I think then, then after, after 89, uh, we got what, we, uh, what, what you were calling advanced art, uh, um, art that, um, that first became art around certain social and political struggles, so-called identity politics and things like that. Then this also went into, into new formats, uh, like those participatory formats. And then this, but then this, this form of art, uh, I think, became very harmonic, harmonic or very, very uh, uh, consensual or, or with the general tendency of, uh, of, of uh, cultural, indus cultural industrial productions around the exploitation of uh, of of the, the the living of of the live um, uh, audience of of li living people of of bio uh, attractions of uh, uh, through participation they became uh, these these kind of uh, uh, objects in, in 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 many art forms and uh, and also it, it it gave a rise to the uh, to the contractual because the the, the, the object side of, of many of these things were were contracts with museums or with collectors or uh, or even with filmmakers or uh, documentaries and cities and so on and um, and um, and there's there's been the, the idea has been been mentioned uh, by this group of people who uh, some of the people who do these uh, former West conferences uh, Maria Zavayeva for example the, the, that they call this period from 1989 to to the, to the financial crisis beginning 2008 they call this the period of contemporary art and uh, contemporary art is, uh, came after postmodernism. Contemporary art is, in, is connected to neoliberalism, and contemporary art is over now. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, for, uh, for, for many reasons. And, uh, but I think one could, in, in relation to what you were saying, uh, save maybe one element of this contemporary art, and that is its struggle around what you were calling Bildung, uh, which has a bureaucratic uh, Side, which is called artistic research, uh, but this uh, this bureaucratic side aside, uh, the the idea behind that uh, is, I think, um, a very precise answer to the problem of contemporaneity or contemporariness, uh, uh, which is kind of a postponed a post postponed character of works, a postponed permanently postponed art, uh, uh, and and. Uh, artistic research uh, understood in this kind of idealist or utopian sense would mean that, uh, that you're no longer finishing artworks. You're constantly producing them, but you're never, you will not finish them again. You will never produce contemporary art. Art will not be contemporary uh, with, um, with, your, with, with the rest of the world. It will be just mm -hmm. uh, postponed, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so um, maybe, this is this is um, uh, 
Ähm, ja, mach das endlich. Ähm, the, the, the issue that I was uh, attempting to touch on just now uh, relates to um, not just how uh, we produce and, and receive image, images um, in this culture, but how we uh, possibly live, live with them. Because mm -hmm. essentially, um, Bildung, certainly in early German Romanticism, is, is, is largely about that. And, and you, see it, you see it discussed and uh, formulated uh, beautifully in, in Novalis's posthumous uh, novel, Henry von Ofterdingen, which was published in 1803. And the, the novel um, opens with the eponymous poet, um, Henry Don Oftendinger. The novel is set in the 14th century, so this is a, the opening of the novel is a breakfast scene. The poet, Henry von uh, Oftendinger, is sitting at the breakfast table with his father and his mother, and uh, they're discussing Henry's dreams. And an interesting discussion develops between uh, Henry, recounting his dream, and his father. Um, Henry's um, response to his dream is essentially, I mean, and this is why the, the, the dialogue is essentially anachronistic. I mean, it's, it's obviously it's written in the end of the um, 18th century, but the novel is set in, in the 14th century. And Novalis puts into the mouth of his poet kind of quasi-Freudian um, uh, quasi defense of the dream as sensuous play. Now, his father um, objects to this on the grounds that, um, that dreams are no longer um, what they were. Mm -hmm. They've fought, they're, they're essentially, um, th their value as a 14th century, have uh, essentially fallen away because dreams are no longer the um, home for prophecy. Now, this dialogue is, uh, is is wholly anachronistic on the grounds that no even upper middle class um, family would have that kind of discussion um, around um, the, uh, the, the dream and the dream and sensuous play. Um, but what, what's interesting about the discussion, and this is repeated through through the novel, is that the um, the image becomes, even though this is a very um, small discursive community, becomes the centre for um, for. Uh, a, a discursive uh, a, a community, and the essential problem of the image under uh, capitalism and modernity is precisely this. How do you sustain um, a living and viable discursive uh, community um, around, around the image? And the history of uh, the production of um, the image under the auspices of modernism and modernization and modernity is, is that. And... Um, so when I, uh, when I saw uh, Hannah's work, uh, I, I, I saw all those historical problems welling up um, because um, they, re they do remain uh, uh, crucial to what we um, might mean by living with the image mm -hmm. under these conditions of, of, of non-symbolic um, um, Reproduction. Um, it's another cliche these days when talking about cognitive capitalism, of course, to talk about the fast turnover of the image, uh, the, um, the, commodifi the, com uh, the complete and endemic commodification of all image production. Um, and uh, um, nevertheless, um, um, we, have to, we, do have, we do have to recognize that as the primary condition of how um, artists begin to build out mm -hmm. um, in order to produce um, modes of attention and effects that will um, um, hopefully create either uh, 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 an actual or, or, or potential um, community reception this notion of, uh, this notion of um, Bildung. So, um, um, well, anyway, I'll leave, I'll leave it for that. Um, Did you? I th well, the, the central point I want to make here is that, um, that um, what, would it, 
what would it mean? Or what, what does it mean precisely to live with the image mm -hmm. today? Because um, although, I, although I've talked about, uh, although I've just talked about image production and, um, and communities of reception, um, what I missed out in, in, in fact, was the, um, the deep response on the part of um, philosophical aesthetics and philosophy and critical theory to this problem as well. Um, I and mean, if you look beyond the Vahlis to, uh, to, well, to Heidegger, Benjamin, uh, Adorno, Blanchot, and so forth, um, I mean, up to uh, Jean Rancière's um, notion of the pensive image, mm -hmm. they're, they're all concerned essentially with, um, with not only with the critique of hermeneutics and the problems with interpretation as such, but with slowing down our uh, uh, empathetic um, capacities when confronted with, with the image. Now, we live in a world where these forms of slowness and slowing down in, the front of, in front of the image are nigh impossible. So um, how might you then construct uh, a community of reception <laughs> under these, under these um, impossi impossible uh, uh, conditions. Okay. And that's yeah. what I think uh, Hannah's work kind of uh, uh, yeah. stresses, or is or actually a better way of putting it, is stressed by. <laughs> uh, it's full of uh, anxiety in the in the face of. Yeah. Dietrich, this sort of building out that John speaks speaks of, yeah. um, the self learning, the speed. Um, I'm interested in drawing that out not only in terms of the reception of the viewer, which you've evoked already, but also in terms of the reception of the producers themselves. I think you used a phrase earlier, which was the production of producers. Yeah. I mean, um, at first, I think, yeah, it has a, it has a lot to do with the, with the time that producers have mm -hmm. and, and the time uh, invested in, in them and, they, and that they are investing. But I think first one has to say that uh, I mean, already when, when, when Freud was looking at dreams, they were already not any longer about prophecy. Uh, uh, so 400 years later or, or whatever, mm -hmm. if after Ofterdi's time or 100 years after, after <laughs> the Wallace times or 70, 80. Um, and uh, why is that? I think because um, people needed the dream time uh, for uh, reproduction, uh, for uh, reproduction in the sense of reproduction of the labor force, but also in a sense of, of uh, reconstructing uh, uh, with all their um, mental forces uh, the last day. And that is the, the classic, the, the central analytical uh, point in, in Freud, that it's, it's the Tagesrest, the, the rest of the day that is, uh, that they, that, that is the material for, for the, the, the stuff that your dreams are made of, you, you're making your dreams of. And, uh, and so this is already a shift. But I think today, the producers, um, the producers in the art world, I think many important producers in the art world are not the ones who actually make work in a sense of, in, in an author authorized sense of uh, being the genius behind the art world, but they are part of a complex organization of people who give by being present, by looking good, by being uh, well-dressed, by knowing to be at the right places at the right time, they make the whole, the whole thing work. And, and they are the ones who actually, uh, um, they, they, they put value onto, onto artworks. Uh, if they were not there as a, as a producing audience, uh, as producing um, audience that is so sometimes involved, sometimes doing precarious jobs, sometimes just an audience, sometimes students, and so on. Uh, the, uh, the, the selection of specific works as being ex extremely expensive would not be possible, and, not, and, and especially also for economic reasons, uh, because all this has to, go, has to go into that, all this kind of bystanding... Uh, um, um, type of uh, labor. And, um, and these people, many of them, uh, they, they do not even enjoy the, um, the work day of a classical laborer who uh, works so and so many hours and then has time for reproduction because the capitalist wants him 
or her to be at the work spot the next day, the workplace the next day, uh, capable of doing his or her job again, because uh, they are constantly doing what they're doing all the time, round the clock. And, uh, and uh, this is a general tendency in cognitive capitalism, but it's a very specific uh, condition of, of the artwork. And there is no time for dreams at all, because you're either you're constantly dreaming or you're, you're never dreaming, because you're, you're not really, you, you don't really, you can't distinguish between uh, work and, and reproduction. And, uh, and you are more in a, in a, in a situation although in a luxurious version of it, of people who have uh, been working under uh, the, prim the, 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 the period of primary accumulation, uh, where there were enough of you uh, to, uh, to produce this, this kind of presence. And uh, it, it, it is not about the single individual and the, the, the reproduction of the work of the single individual. So there are no dreams left in, in that. In that. Um, and, um, and I mean that... Um, um, this is an issue that that um, that should be addressed under the uh, also in relation to to current developments of uh, of prices of how it in the last I don't know two or three decades uh, the the people who in general particip participated in the art world and the prices how how the increasing of two of the two things is related to each other also in a, on an economical level. I wanted to ask you something slightly different. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to spend a bit of time thinking about desire. And I was interested in your use of pathos earlier. And I had seen the image in, in the theatre space as being bathotic rather than pathotic. Okay, a fall from right to left. Um, well it it's certainly monstrous. I, mean, I don't know where you would place monstrousness in, in, in uh, between between those two um, uh, extremes. Um, y you want me to? Speak I'm interested in. Or I'm or interested in the relationship between. Um, well, I'm interested in thinking about desire for a little bit, and um, thinking a little around what Dietrich was saying about the about the, the lack of dream time that's precipitated by um, a desire to be involved, in a sense, you know, constantly on, um, in a zombie-like manner. But the desire that would lead to that and the sort of, the, the lack of the sort of, the lack of pathos that might be associated with that. Well, uh, pathos is, 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 is essentially um, an historical emotion. I would I, I, I'd argue that. Mm. that um, that um, pa pathos emerges when um, we experience a gap between what we what we want mm. and hope, um, on the basis that um, that um, that, it, that it, it cannot be fulfilled, <laughs> but at the same time. We are aware that um, our sense of loss is based upon what we imagine to be um, um, well, what we imagine um, to be um, sig uh, signif significant. In, in the past, mm. um, but that can no longer, um, um, but 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 that can no longer um, 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 renew itself. So, it's based upon um, a sense of, um, of, of of loss in those terms. But the thing with pathos is also it, it can be a, a creative uh, emotion in, mm. in that sense. That uh, is, in the, through this gap. Between between the past and, and the present, um, one um, one can imagine um, uh, the significance of what has been lost fulfilling <coughs> itself under under new conditions. So that's why pathos is also um, uh, very much a uh, a, a, 
a revolutionary experience, and that's why we can talk about the, uh, the pathos of, of, of futures past, of, of past revolutions, past revolutions that, uh, that, in, uh, that engage a sense of the future that are, you know, that are no longer, um, that are no longer um, um, available. So, um, um, bathos is something quite different. As I said, I mean, bathos is an experience of a, of a fall from um, the high, high to the low, and that's usually accompanied by uh, a sense of of, of, um, of abject failure and um, and of maybe of, of, of even of of, of, of an of, of an impasse and, and, and stultification. Now, um, these these emotions. I mean, these historical emotions are always stirred um, when when we look at images uh, in our in our cultures. Mm. This is precisely what, uh, what Benjamin and Frederick Jameson meant, meant by, the, by by the by the political unconscious. But um, um, when I when I look at Hannah's work, um, I'm I'm kind of well I'm. I'm pulled, you know, I'm pulled between these two um, sets of experiences, these two mm. sets, two sets of emotions. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Dietrich, which emotion would you associate with surplus? <laughs> I'm just, I'm thinking about. Uh, I don't mean well. I, I maybe I do mean that was perfectly what you said. Um, in terms of this sense of wit witness, a uh, uh, sort of an embed, uh, you know. thing that interests me uh, really about the show before I saw it uh, was uh, I could didn't understand that surplus desire. Uh, I, I, uh, I didn't see any connection between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, and I, uh, the, I think that in my, if I translate surplus to, to the language in which I'm mostly thinking, it, it is such a um, dry economic uh, uh, term it 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 distinguishes um, uh, it, it, it's actually the, the the architecture of the permanent uh, robbing betrayal uh, um, and uh, how is that how how can that be connected with desire of course there is this there is this, if you translate it into a Deleuzian uh, language and and you think of you think of machines and you think of production in a in a um, in an uneconomical way uh, that is possible. But but this this specific term is so much given for uh, for for the a, a calculating subject, uh, a calculating uh, powerful subject. And so um, well, I, I actually I can quite under I, I can quite understand why um, um, the, the title surplus desire was. Was given to to, the, to to this talk on on that basis. I mean, in the in the Spinozian, Deleuzian, Leotardian tradition, surplus desire doesn't exist in a sense. There's simply desire, which is um, spontaneous and uh, self-affirming. So it, it would be redundant and superfluous to talk about surplus um, desire. Surplus desire, um, on the other hand, does have a, a place and home within the Freudian, Hegelian, Marxist tradition. That is. Um, when you, uh, in that tradition, surplus desire is that desire that uh, is it, that exceeds the desire that is possible at a given uh, at, a, at a given time. Um, it is supplemental to what we can or or cannot cannot desire. So, and who, I don't understand that. Who, don't who, who who is the who is the subject of such desire? Uh, 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 well, that's why I'm saying I don't, underst I don't understand this notion of surplus. I, I can I can grasp the, the notion with the notion within a Freudian Hegelian Marxist tradition, um, but I, I'm I'm not sure how it relates to, um, to to that Spinozian Deleuzean Leotardian tradition. Well, of, uh, well in, in uh, a Marxist sense, it, it, it is it is uh, uh, it is like uh, like the maintaining of, of daily life. It's uh, there, there is no there is no desire involved. It's it's. Uh, uh, or, or as much desire as is necessary to uh, uh, to have a to have a blood circulation, something like that. Uh, it, it is it, surplus is is nothing special. It's, it's it's not more. It's just it's just what what is needed. It's just a it's just a capitalist uh, daily life. It's it's a um, and um, 
And I thought, uh, I mean, um, the the place where we were, we were talking about about dream time or time uh, time devoted mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to 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 non-productive uh, uh, to to periods that are not connected to circulation and to and to communication. Uh, uh, there you can uh, find something. Like that, and then, but then I would say one has to look at the at the history of how uh, modern or contemporary or post contemporary art has addressed uh, in the past the idea of of dreaming mm -hmm. uh, of of either a withdrawal of uh, a, a dreaming as a withdrawal or dreaming as a production, uh, and I, would, I have to think of the the formation of the um, of, of dream. Music, um, the dream, dream syndicate, or uh, the theater of eternal music, mm -hmm. as it was called, uh, uh, Lamonte Young, and Tony Conrad, John mm -hmm. Cale, Angus McLeish, and Marion Cecilia, and how uh, they had a they had a, a rupture, a break between the fraction that thought of of these long uh, uh, drones of the stealing of periodicity of rhythm of. of Getting out of temporality as some kind of an <laughs> anti-capitalist aggression, and the other half who were thinking of this as some kind of uh, permanent place of asylum of uh, of uh, religiously understood exile from the world, uh, and how this was how they how, uh, for at least for three years they could they could do that together. They could they could think of these two we would think opposing ideas of of dream production. Uh, and uh, and still do it together, um, and uh, yeah. I'd like. Are you desperate? To, are you desperate? No, 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 no. No, go on, go on. No, I can. I can wait. Um, I'm just conscious that I want to make sure that our audience yeah. get an opportunity to ask some questions. We've maybe got about half an hour for questions, okay, something like that. Questions. Um, it's quite difficult because of the lighting for me to see you, so you'll need to really, like, um, you know. Oh, fabulous, thank you. Um, do we have, um, we've got a microphone that needs to go around, so any questions, if you wouldn't mind waiting for the microphone. Oh, fantastic, yourself there. I have a question to John Roberts. Um, I was wondering why you think precisely that this lack of collective capital today is crisis? Because for me, it's a wonderful um, continuation of this plurality of voices that we have and the plurality of the players that actually entered um, the field of cultural production after 1993, where um, the book uh, by Bouthier was published. So I don't quite understand why the book from sorry by Bourdieu that you referred Bourdieu. to yes yeah. was published so um, if you could explain why you I find that the crisis um, I'm trying to ask um, uh, an important and, and simple um, question I mean what is what is the life of the image under, under capitalism, under cognitive capitalism. Maybe this is the wrong question to ask. Maybe we shouldn't be asking um, what the life of a, of a single image is, is at all. And in, in one sense, um, I would agree with that kind of, of, of reservation. Um, but nevertheless, um, um, how do artists work through the image form under these prevailing conditions. Now, I've, uh, I've talked about this notion of the, of, of the non-symbolic that I, I derive from Wilhelm uh, uh, Flusser. Now, essentially, the non-symbolic is attached to um, um, the cognate notion of non-reproduction. Um, um, what is it about contemporary capitalism um, that that is non-reproducible. What is capitalism failing to, um, to, 
to reproduce? Well, um, we can list a whole uh, uh, number of uh, material things on that on that s score. It's failing to um, re reproduce the conditions whereby the welfare state would, would flourish. Um, it's uh, failing to reproduce um, um, necessary financial reserves in order for uh, pensions to be um, maintained at uh, a reasonable level. It's, fa it's failing to uh, reproduce the, its material infrastructures on, on a global basis. It's failing to re uh, reproduce the, um, um, uh, the, the living conditions for our, our, uh, for our ecological wef um, welfare and, <coughs> and so forth. Um, and and similarly, it's it's failing to uh, it's failing to reproduce um, what I would call um, the light of images, um, um, the light of images that we have uh, is highly um, attenuated. I mean, it's been highly attenuated for for a long time. I mean, I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying that you know, uh, with the rise of cognitive capitalism, uh, uh, as I as I touched on, um, the loss of affect. Um, the fragmentation, the reception, the crisis of building suddenly um, you know, emerges. But um, it's interesting, though, as a kind of response to this long and ongo on ongoing crisis of living with, in response to the production of images and, and art through the second half of the 20th century, that today there should be a huge um, and englobing an attempt by um, a huge number of artists to construct an audience for their work and for themselves as a constitutive part of what they do. That's essentially what relational aesthetics, post-relational aesthetics, participatory practice and the great turn to the sociali socialization of, of art is all about because um, it's, it's having, uh, because this work is having to fight its corner against the increasing market socialization of art in which um, um, particular, uh, particular um, works, particular artists um, um, become um, attached to um, a community of reception that is based solely upon um, what we might call consumerist decisions. And that's why I, um, I emphasize the importance of, of, moderni of modernism more generally, but uh, modernist painting, certainly from 1920 to, to the 1960s and to the development of, of documentary practice that created these, um, that created these extraordinary communities of reception that, that, um, that had, um, had a, had a <laughs> not, only, not only produced um, a critical public within, within the confines of what we now call the art world, but, but had uh, impact and ramifications outside of the, the, the cloistered wor world of the, of, uh, of the art world. So, um, um, although, although we can't uh, avoid talking about the crisis of, of, of um, a critical public for art, we can't, we can't avoid talking about the crisis of, of Bildung. Um, the drive to produce a critical public, the drive to produce some notion of Bildung, is, is actually is, continu is, is built into the aporetic um, condition of art production and uh, mm. its reception. Yeah. Yes. John to add to that, did you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that precisely this, this for out of this movement, out of this uh, um, paradigm, um, the uh, the whole contemporary situation with an uh, under or non-paid audience as producer uh, has come out. I mean, the, the, uh, this is, I think that, that I'm, 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 this not, I'm not saying that, that um, uh, all these works were failures or were, were, um, were unnecessary or uh, otherwise uh, misguided, but I think that uh, the, entire, the entire idea to uh, um, to include uh, guests and uh, and participants and underpaid or non-paid people in the production of things that that have taken on in a more and more sophisticated way commodity form uh, is something that is not only 
kind of a, a problem on a on an economical or an ethical level, mm. but on an aesthetical level. Yeah. And uh, and some and and it, and it is it is just I think it, it happened and developed in the same period in which uh, in, in in popular culture uh, reality TV uh, uh, made its rise and it it, it all participated in a in what I call the reversal of uh, uh, um, uh, from spectacle to the to participation of spectacle uh, that that the the in 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 under contemporary conditions uh, uh, mass culture as well as so called art uh, um, um, together uh, no longer have the job uh, as under spectacle to sedate uh, uh, masses who otherwise would uh, go on strike or uh, or, 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 or become uh, uh, wild or uh, um, but uh, but in order to animate people uh, it's, it's the, the, the this, this this process that the the the, the um, the task of, of cultural industrial production is to constantly animate people and to, and this this kind of uh, industrialized animation of uh, depressed, overworked, uh, uh, overcharged uh, subjects is uh, um, is something that that um, um, started with um, with this kind of post postmodern uh, uh, contemporary art practices uh, around the social and. Uh, yeah, just to well, I, I kind of I I this evening I want I wanted to to focus on the um, on the reception of the image on communities reception, but I, I'm kind of like f forced to uh, to back down from that. I mean, I've I've taught I've in you know, in, pu in, in public lectures and presentations I've given um, uh, recently I, I've talked a lot about um, the changing conditions of art, art production over the last 20 years, and uh, Dietrich has been mapping out some of the, the, those changing conditions. And in fact, Dietrich, uh, Dietrich contributed to uh, an excellent collection that, he, um, that uh, Eflux um, uh, published on, on artistic to, uh, labor today. Mm. And in this collection, and, and a number of other, other, uh, um, uh, another, uh, other uh, publications, I mean, what is, I mean, what is, what is affecting um, the, the, the production and reception uh, of, of art today is what we might call the uh, the quasi the quasi proletarianization of, of the artist. Now, what do I, what do I mean by that? Well, the fact that uh, increasingly um, um, uh, artists are are being forced to um, um, become Wage laborers, wage laborers, in order to um, produce work that will have um, no possibility of exchange of, of entering that benighted um, world of exchange value and, and the art market. So, what has been created over the last twenty years is what I would uh, call a, a second uh, economy of of artists. That is, um, artists who work on a part-time basis, um, who, um, you know, either, um, who are engaged in uh, part-time jobs or they might have a little bit of teaching and so forth, although that's very rare, uh, rare these days. Um, and nevertheless, um, they labour as artists without um, reproducing the conditions that would en that, that will enable them to have a kind of mm -hmm. a, con a conventional career or identity uh, of an artist that um, that was mm -hmm. taken for granted mm -hmm. 20, tw 25 years ago, mm -hmm. and, and this is matched by the increasing number of uh, of, of, of artists uh, um, in in response to you know, the new participatory practice, who were who were working in the area of what we might call the service industries. Now these artists may. You know, be working, say, with architects on regeneration schemes, or working uh, on environmental projects. Engaged in various kinds of, of practices that have some kind of, of of social function outside of the traditional confines of the of, of, of the art world. And now, um, in these instances, artists are essentially um, wage laborers who are, uh, are, are contributing to um, to. to to capital um, accumulation. Now, 
Historically, uh, classically, what has defined artistic labor from, um, from productive labor or non-productive labor, that is working in factories or you know, working in, work in the serv service industries proper, is the fact that artists' labor was not subject to um, the dictates you know, of the value form, that is, the need to produce work to a deadline, to speed up, to produce work um, 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 according to um, uh, a, given, a given template. Now, um, it seems to me that there are an increasing number of, uh, of artists who uh, uh, are in, res in response to this semi-proletarianized uh, condition of, of artisticness as such, uh, are transforming themselves willingly into, into wage laborers. Now, this is not um, uh, this is not a generalized condition. Uh, when I talk about a second economy, I'm not saying that um, the thousands and thousands of artists are, are, are producing art under these conditions. I'm not saying that at all. But um, uh, as with the rise of immaterial labor with, uh, under cognitive capitalism, this is a preponderant uh, tendency mm -hmm. within within the art world at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even say. Um, I would even go further. I mean, uh, the, um, whenever the value of art is discussed, or whenever there are uh, um, uh, changes in, 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 in the, the cycles of, of prices and so on, uh, the, the, there is a tendency to say um, the, um, you cannot explain um, you cannot explain the art economy in relation to general economy. I think it's kind of covering up the fact that. Um, there is no absolute rarity or uh, or specificity uh, that um, that is invested in uh, all these all these 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 uh, uh, qualifications are uh, produced by by producers. Mm -hmm. They are produced uh, by uh, by labors, and these labors used to be uh, certified experts, art historians, or whatever. Uh, now they they are a scene that produces the same kind, the same kind of value attribution, and uh, and um, and this is similar to the way uh, in the financial market uh, values are produced. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also it's it's, it, it's, it's also mo mostly discussed in the, in, in the terminology of uh, something has gone wrong with uh, with our economy. It's as the second economy. It, it has. It has no connection to the first economy. It's a complete uh, world of its own. There are the speculators among themselves, and they have this. Uh, they have the software, and they are so fast and so on. But again, this is this is uh, 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 this is labor, uh, specialized labor invested in in value attribution. And the and the, the difference is that in the financial market, at least uh, those people who in, who are uh, who are doing this uh, are making a fortune, whereas uh, in. in the this is not happening at all. Question. Um, I'm interested in what you're saying, Dietrich, about um, when you talk about a scene, um, I think about New York and I think about New York in you know, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. And the scene, obviously, it's a mixture of musicians and visual artists. And it's not just, it wasn't just about capitalism, it wasn't pre World Trade Center, but very often it was about a discussion between creative people. And one thing that I think is really important when we think about art is to, to address something that was really strong when it, I mean, I might sound a bit old fashioned, but one artist I always like to go back to is Sol Lewitt and the idea of purpose. And I think that something that needs to be addressed is not just an overall kind of um, covering of this and that, but to talk about purpose, because when you talk about groups of artists and you talk about ideas, um, one has to look at address and ask the artist what their exact purpose is in making their work. I, I have to make myself clear at this point. I'm, I'm not saying that because uh, a scene has the function of attributing value, it's only doing that. Uh, I would say that it's today still the same thing. Of course, it's 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 uh, it's uh, serious people having serious and not so serious discussions. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, inebriated, sometimes not. Uh, and and just like the art object itself is at the same time a commodity and something else, uh, 
all these conversations are at the same time attributing value and they are something else. Uh, the difference is that, um, that uh, the, uh, the economic factor of these, uh, of these innocent, interesting, serious conversations uh, on attributing uh, value to artworks has increased and the, and the payment or, or whatever, any kind of gratification uh, for this working audience uh, of a scene or whatever has uh, uh, decreased and, uh, and dramatically. And, uh, and the number of participants in that has also dramatically increased. It was, I think this is maybe now uh, 200 times as many people as there used to be in 1983. And uh, so they, 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 uh, they're generating more value, but not it, it's by the, same, by the same factor that there are more people. And on the other hand, also the, the, the way um, this value is generated uh, um, is, is different from, from then. Then uh, everyone was more, the people were much more related to, to kind of traditional functions and jobs within the art, uh, within the art world. And uh, the conversations they produced on the side were things they had to do with their profession or with their job. And, and for the job they were, or at least some of them, were somehow paid. And, uh, and this is less and less the fact. Oh, get you in a minute. <laughs> I, I found it quite interesting, your idea of the second economy, and then Diedrich, your idea of the producer um, producing value of works. And I was hoping if we could talk about art as a commodity, then we could start speaking about the immaterial and the speculation or accumulation of institutions with participatory or um, performance art, mm -hmm. and that being, uh, if we think of the artist as labor creating an object, then that, that the, the object itself is tied to the body and them trying to somehow archive or collect this. And to take this maybe one step further with, say, an example of Tino, Tino Segal's work, we can talk about the contract, because you brought up the contract as this place of memory, but then if the memory is thus taken away through the contract being verbal, then how does this also affect the art market? And uh, perhaps you could elaborate a bit further on these ideas. I, I think the, 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 uh, one can say that there is a tendency to... Uh, um, that, that the formats of storing and uh, defining the object, the art object, uh, went through, of course, a, um, a sequence of abstractions. So uh, from, from uh, more concrete uh, models um, like museums or museum storage or uh, uh, through um, uh, just agreements and finally a contract. And of course these, these have a lot to do with, the, uh, with, uh, with parallel developments on the aesthetic level. Uh, uh, the, the, of course, that's a, that's a, the, the contractuality is a is an, is an element of, of conceptual art and uh, uh, has been introduced uh, by conceptual art and that's of course uh, something that is uh, I don't know if one can say uh, quoted or uh, taken up uh, but or revived or whatever by by Tino Segal. But I think the the uh, the point is uh, this this progress towards abstraction, uh, the question is what, what the context of that is. And, uh, and of course, one can say that the ultimate abstraction would be just money. Uh, that is, uh, uh, this is kind of the, um, uh, it, it just stops short of it uh, if you are somewhere just, just exchanging contracts. On the other hand, this contract format uh, allows practically anything to put into it. So if you look at it from an, from an, from an uh, uh, artistic point of view, you could, and, and just for thought experimental reason, uh, um, separated from from the from the history of art economy, uh, it could be some kind of uh, very challenging uh, um, way to to define uh, relations uh, of people involved in artworks, and uh, and this is also what has been done, of course, by by several artists already. And uh, but uh, but but 
it can't be separated on the other hand and uh, um, yeah I think that is that is a problem and uh, it has a lot to do with the fact that um, there is a need to redefine all kind of artistic practices that have nothing to do, that, that used to have nothing to do with the visual arts mm -hmm. uh, but that have lost their business model <coughs> uh, uh, I mean experimental film used to have uh, support structures uh, at least in some countries of the world and it has more or less completely lost them so experimental film as a as a practice has migrated completely into the art world and others are following now and uh, and all of these practices that have no kind of historical practice, practice related um, uh, deep connection with the history of contemporary visual art, uh, they of course, uh, um, yeah, they, they uh, embrace these uh, contractual, the, the offer of, of the contractual format. John, would you like to add to that? Um, what I would like to uh, talk a little bit about is the relationship between um, what I've called Bildung and uh, communities of, of, of reception and this question of value, because um, that's where value was embedded. Um, I mean, let's look at um, let's look at the development of, of modernism in relation to this. Um, it was. It was largely because of the um, the impact of, of modernist criticism on producers, and then uh, the impact of producers on the development of, of, of modernist criticism that um, that underwrote the the formation of a critical public for for, for modernism. Today. Um, the place of criticism itself in that mediatory um, role no longer no longer exists. Um, it really hasn't existed for um, maybe you know, 20, 20, 20 or, or thirty years, and that's why um, artists themselves have largely taken over this critical mediatory role in the spirit of I suppose of, of um, the early avant-garde and conceptual art in, 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 in the 1960s, because they they now operate um, in a in a space where value and uh, um, and value judgments are are wholly tied to to forms of mark of market socialisation, um, which means that um, the market. So like the primary art market um, no longer needs criticism and at the you know, furthest extreme theory to make uh, make judgments uh, for it. It can get on um, you know, quite uh, quite nicely. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, selling work at Biennales and, 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 and elsewhere without any of that kind of machinery in place. Um, well, with any of that kind of machinery, bright providing value judgments uh, for, the, for the sale of works. I think we've time for two more questions. There's a fellow who's been waiting for a while here, and there's a woman up there. And then we'll see how we go. So my question actually picks up on this last point. I, I wanted to ask you about this concept of build them to tease it out more, because I strongly agree about this idea of a crisis that you're talking about, but I'm not sure as to whether or not you think that building is sort of a productive concept now, or if it's just nostalgic, because you were talking about things like relational... Uh, uh, aesthetics that do yeah. seem to be quite nostalgic. And to me, it seems that when you're talking about um, modernism from the 20s to the 50s, say, yes. um, there was a sense of building in that period, but a very unrealized one in the sense that it was a very small group of people that we're talking about who wanted yes. to generalize this idea of building, yes. who wanted to go out to the workers in some cases or, or other things. That's right. And yeah. what happened in the 60s is that this thing started to become realized in a way. You know, you start to get a huge critical output. The artists themselves start to write massive amounts. Yes. Vogue magazine is putting out critical <laughs> articles, quite good articles on art that anybody from the middle class at least can go and read. And yet when you get this, suddenly building doesn't work anymore because there's no critical consensus, anyone can say or read whatever they want, you don't need this critical mediation. So I guess my question is, Is in that situation, is building just like a nostalgic idea of regression, or can we actually use this concept somehow? That's, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I've, I've, a, 
I have a lot of time for relation aesthetics and post-relation aesthetics. And well, I have a lot of, a lot of, of time for this for this socialized turn in artist in artist in artistic practice because um, it it shifts uh, it shifts the focus of art production and its reception um, back to um, its uh, its historic avant-garde um, uh, precursors, um, obviously. In, in Operating in very different social and, and political circumstances, but um, um, it does this, and this is where it isn't nostalgic. It does this uh, on the basis that um, that the making of art and um, the, the talking of, of, about art and uh, in a sense the uh, as, as a consequence the, the production of, of a reception of culture for art a part of the same continuum now as you rightly put it um, one could um, describe the whole history of modern practice of modernism as, as that but um, but um, it's really only now, in a sense, that we can talk um, about this um, uh, this exchange or or or, or, in, or or interchange between production, um, uh, discursivity, and and reception. We can only talk about this um, uh, exchange today, give it in a qualitatively new way. Given the transformed um, status of art artistic production itself, the fact that there are um, there's, a, uh, there's been an exponential increase in, in artists across the globe, art schools across the globe, universities and art departments across the globe are producing more artists now than than than, than ever. As you know, the, 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 there are um, region, there are regional there are regional <laughs> art markets that that. that that support or don't support a lot of this practice, and these regional art, art markets are increasingly uh, integrated. So there's um, there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a bit of global expansion of artistic production. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. You can say that this is um, a surplus to requirements. This is a glut, or and this is my argument that. Um, and this is where I get um, uh, a bit fancy pants, and, um, and I'm kind of uh, prepared to accept at least um, one of, um, of, um, of the, uh, the 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 dominant categories um, of, of of understanding of cognitive capitalism. That is this question of gen uh, general intellect. Um, there has been. Uh, an extraordinary um, expansion of, of, of general intellect within the culture in which artists, as producers of things and of meaning, have contributed to, contributed to enormously over the last uh, 20 years. So, um, in terms of the dynamics of the global economy and, and, and our second economy, yes, there is a glut. If one wants, wants to look at it They're cynically in, in those terms, but. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, what I mean, what we ha we're, what we have now is a situation in which a huge number of of, of artists, um, um, full time artists, uh, part time artists, occasional artists, and so forth, um, are produ are producing um, um, meaning and affects and effects. Outside of the primary art market. Now, um, I think this is this is um, this is a general historical tendency. So, um, rather than talking about the primary um, art market and the secondary um, uh, economy, I think we really need to talk about the, the secondary, um, or the second economy as the primary art market, because this is this is the economy where the majority of artists uh, uh, produce, where they exchange ideas. Um, where they um, you know, you know, collect materials, and where they yeah, and where they struggle to make meaning. So this is an economy where very few things are sold or exchanged to the market. But nonetheless, it's it's an economy that is, in many ways, driving um, the um, yeah, 
driving value in, in, in art, I mean, critical value in art. Right? Mm -hmm. um. I mean, the, 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 in, 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 in German, the term Bildung is um, strictly <coughs> a, a bourgeois concept. It's, uh, uh, it has, it is, um, it's, it's emancipatory uh, content uh, that one can find in it on a, on a, on a level of the category, on a, on a level of, of uh, uh, has never been uh, implemented in, in, its, uh, in its institutions. Um, and, uh, and when I'm thinking of communities of art or communities of art reception, uh, it, it's, it's hard for me to, to think of it in, in terms of Bildung, because I think even if, if that is a requirement, this kind of border condition for, uh, for certain, uh, for, or has been historically for certain critical uh, discourses in relation to art, it, it has never left the building, so to speak. It's never, it has never uh, went out, outside of, the, uh, of those who, who were always educated to, to know about it. Uh, so if I ever would would, would uh, think of, of conditions of uh, where the where the the community of reception is important, I would think of moments moments of course in histories of countercultures that were transgressing this uh, um, the, um, the bourgeois limit of, of of art production at least at least momentarily. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but um, and and I, I agree with with your description about the. Uh, the but there is the there is uh, there is no there is no bourgeois reception of of, of, of art anymore. There's no um, uh, yeah, yeah. bourgeois uh, criticism of, of art anymore. Well, um, it, it yeah, but but what what um, um, there's I, a bourgeois I, there's a bourgeois culture in which art part, you know. Um, uh, yeah. No, I, I, so no, no, I would say I don't think the bourgeoisie has has. Uh, it, the bourgeoisie it's in relation flown. to art, the no, it, it has fallen to two parts. Mm. Uh, in, in, a, in a lower middle class, still educated lower middle class, uh, that does exactly the kind of work that you were describing, that I, was, I also were describing in a slightly different way, and of course into uh, a, a very, very small fraction that is, that is, uh, um, that is buying things from time to time without connecting this to some kind of uh, value or, or, um, or cultural idea and uh, and that is of course a new situation but it's still in this is still in this situation it is it is not different from countercultural moments it's not transgressing certain forms of uh, of education that are only available to the middle class a brief response John okay, then we've well got to move on that has everything to do with the fact that um, that the that the classic bourgeoisie no longer exists and the bourgeoisie bourgeoisie today largely consists of uh, salaried managers who have no vested interest in, uh, in the continuity of bourgeois cultural uh, values and therefore have certainly no interest uh, in, 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 def uh, in, in, in defining a, uh, a, new, a new... But if, sorry, but if that would be the case, then there wouldn't be so much money. Then there would, we wouldn't have a crisis in which, in which, of course, this bourgeois money filter through the state is going away everywhere, but there's all this money in the, in the private sector, and, and that is coming exactly from, from that kind of institution. The way they, the way they are, uh, they are uh, continuing the bourgeois uh, interest in art is completely different. I agree completely with that, but it's, but it's still the same class that, uh, um, that, that uh, um, ha whose power has even um, uh, risen. No? Uh, I'm, moving, I'm moving to our last question. Sorry, uh, Andrea? Well, my, some of my question has actually been answered by the last exchange, but to, to maybe rephrase it slightly then, thinking on my feet, um, I was interested in um, moralism, actually, as, as kind of demonstrated also in the, past, in, in the last exchange. Or another way of asking the question of moralism is um, why isn't Deirdre's, um community of producers not as an avant-garde or an alternative, but as a mainstream, why is it not the Bildung now? Just to clarify, Andre, you're making a distinction between moralism, uh, the, the moral and the ethical? Yes, yes. What's the distinction you're making? Well, uh, well um, I think ethics is a certain kind of branch of philosophy, mm. and mm -hmm. moralism is a, a set of beliefs mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that are um, instigating an argument or instigating mm -hmm. a set of conditions, mm -hmm. or not conditions, beliefs that are that are that are 
um, on display. Mm. John. S sorry, are you, you're accusing both of us of moralism, or no? Or I'm wondering the about the moral. For <laughs> instance, I'm interested in the. I I for instance, in the most recent um, set of uh, exchanges about what the what the bourgeoisie is in relationship to this. And, well, and, the bourgeoisie's cultural role has definitely changed, and it's definitely yeah. changed uh, given its um, its um, its renegotiated place within you know, within. Um, state and uh, relation, the relations of reduction. Yeah. Uh, but you sound like you're mourning the loss of it. Is that no, right? No, 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 I'm not mourning okay. the loss. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying, I wasn't mourning the loss of it. Um, I'm, I'm saying that's, in many ways, that's why um, um, art criticism no longer has the kind of high cultural place that it has. Because um, that classic bourgeois culture, certainly up until Greenberg and uh, and and freed, uh, uh, un underwrote um, um, the underwrote the defence of certain uh, public values. Um, that 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 tradition is in well, it's in in, in, in no longer exists. So um, it's. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm not mourning its loss. I'm saying that this is this is the condition under which um, the reduction of value, um, uh, value judgment, and and the art world operates. Um. Dietrich morality. Um, morality, no. I mean uh, uh, the um, the diagnosis about. Um, um, the, the disappearance of the bourgeoisie or the or, or, or major oh, the bourgeoisie has not disappeared major right? shift <laughs> within the construction of the bourgeoisie uh, uh, I think is 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 important to, to, to at least to at least talk about in relation to uh, the shifts in in in, uh, um, in cultural politics that that, that, uh, that we witness all over the world uh, but. Paradoxically, it has not, uh, one could say, uh, the bourgeoisie leaves the building in the, uh, in the discipline of connecting uh, uh, private money power with, uh, with a set of beliefs. Uh, but uh, they're, they're, uh, the, the, um, the, the caricature of the bourgeoisie, um, uh, which, which was only interested in, in, in an instrumental way, in uh, in values because uh, because they, 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 they were about to turn values moral values into economic values this caricature of the bourgeoisie is actually in charge now and uh, is is very much shaping the fact that uh, uh, um, and uh, and the reasons why people like experimental filmmakers have to not work now in the art world and cannot any longer work with uh, TV stations mm -hmm. or uh, things like that and uh, uh, because in a minimum 20, if not much more, years of, uh, of privatization of, of more and more uh, um, uh, institutions, um, private money is more and less, more, uh, much more deciding about culture, and, the, uh, and, the, and among the fields of culture in which private money can decide, and where the structures are open for private money to to immediately have an influence and immediately decide, and, and, and that is uh, that is the art world, uh, the visual art world. And uh, but then there is, I think, the, the visual art world also, in order to still be meaningful, uh, and 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 to which so this is this meaningfulness supports the the also the economic value. It needs this other life of uh, social engaged um, uh, participatory projects. Um, which uh, which are uh, which are uh, also increasing much. They they they, they happening in, in a much higher uh, to a much higher degree now, and and they are financed less and less and less, uh, and happening more and more and more. Uh, they 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 are financed by by poor city governments and so on, and uh, but they but their function for the for the uh, for the value attribution of the rest of the art world is important. There's a lot of exchange going on between these two worlds. There are people who start their career in, in, the, in, in that socially engaged world and become superstars in, in, in the other one. Uh, there are writers uh, who, who 
that, that is a very, very frequent uh, situation. There are writers whose, whose values, ideas, and so on are shaped by, by this uh, um, manifesto world, and, uh, uh, but, but in order to make a living, they, they're writing for this other world, but they're using the same kind of thought, so this thought is kind of a priceless uh, object bought by the other one, and so on. And, and this, this construction, I think, uh, um, is, um, uh, is important to look at. And, and it has, of course, elements of, uh, of community and of, of building, if you wish. But it's, uh, it's, it's highly uh, problematic and unstable and uh, precarious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, I feel you'd like to add to that, and then we must finish. No. Is that it? I've done. Are you done? I'm sorry to have to leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>